Well, good morning. It's good to see everyone this morning. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn with me to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. If you have a bulletin, just open up the bulletin. You'll be able to follow along with my lesson this morning. It has all the scripture references. You'll be able to turn right there. It's good to see everyone. We have quite a number of visitors with us. We're certainly glad that you're with us. We hope that you'll come back and be with us again. All across the nation, we're, you know and I know, that we're celebrating this important day of remembering mothers. A woman, a mother, is a gift of God, a special creation. In Genesis chapter 2, or if you'd like to turn there, Genesis chapter 2, beginning verse 22, then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man, and Adam said, this is... Now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be, be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. None of us would be here if it were not for God, for a man and a mother who loved us and carried us through to birth. When Eve had her first child, in Genesis chapter 4, she said, Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. A mother is a teacher, a nurse, a psychologist, a pharmacist, a guide, a dietitian, a counselor, a tooth extractor, a taxi driver, and so much more. Happy Mother's Day. Now I'd like for you to turn to John chapter 20, and I'd like for us to look at an event that happened in the life of Thomas and the life of all the apostles in Jesus, an event that occurred in Jesus' resurrection, an event that pertains to every man, every woman, every child. The most at one of the most important and moving events in the resurrection. An eyewitness account recorded for us to strengthen us of our faith today. And, and what I love about this, it, it's a wondrous event that we can easily visualize in our mind and we can see the event taking place and we can see it unfold. We can see them talk. We can see them move. We can see their actions. It's so easy to see this scene as it comes alive to us. An event that makes us say to ourselves, Oh, I wish I was there. Oh, I wish I'd have been there. But we had this so we could. We are there. In John chapter 20, beginning at verse number 19. John chapter 20. Let me hurry up and get there too. I forgot. John chapter 20, beginning at verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, when the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad and when they saw the Lord. And so Jesus said to them, Peace be to you or peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. 
And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of many, the sin, their sins are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of many, they are retained. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. What a spectacular event. Our mind is able to see everything I flow through. A historical event in history. Jesus had risen from the dead. He is our Savior. He is our Redeemer. And on this evening, when the disciples assembled in that room, the doors were shut tight. They were in fear of the Jews. In their minds, they're thinking they want us just as bad as they want Jesus. They won't even hesitate punishing us. These same men that crucified Jesus are looking for us too. They won't hesitate harming us. And they're trying to figure out in that room exactly what to do. Jesus appeared to them in the room because stone walls and shut doors can't keep him out. And Jesus said, peace be to you. The disciples were amazed to see them. They looked at his hands. They looked at his side. He breathed on them the Holy Spirit. And we know of the 12 disciples, two were missing. For this meeting, one, of course, was Judas who committed suicide, the traitor. But where was Thomas for this meeting? Where was he? When all the disciples ran away, when Jesus was arrested, did he go so far he can't get back? <laughs> or did he just want to go off and grieve so he could alone in his grief? The Bible does not tell us and I believe that God has a reason why. Yeah. And he's going to show us that this morning. Yeah. Thomas was a faithful apostle. And when we think of him, what's the word that comes to mind? Doubting. Doubting Thomas. That's the first word that comes to mind when we think of him. Doubting Thomas. And Thomas was much more than this. All the apostles were known for something. Peter was known, quick to speak, quick to act, and many times that got himself in trouble. Thomas was full of courage. The Lord hand-picked him, and he kept on being an apostle, rain or shine, thick or thin. He served faithfully until his death. I want to go back for a second from this event right here. I want to go back and look at two other events that are recorded for us in the life of Thomas. Just outside of Jerusalem, Lazarus had died in Bethany. And Jesus was going to raise him from the dead after four days. In John chapter 11, verse 7 and 8, then after he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again, the disciples said to him, Rabbi, Lately, the Jews sought to stone you, and you are wanting to go back there again? The Jews tried to stone Jesus there, and now he wants to go back. You got to be kidding, they're saying to themselves. They don't know that he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. The apostles didn't know yet that Jesus' time had not yet come. And all they know is it's dangerous. And to them, it was just asking for trouble. Then Thomas speaks up. I want you to look at what Thomas says. He isn't crazy about the idea either of going back. In John chapter 11, verse 16, then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Did you catch that? Thomas likes to look at the facts. He figures that they're all going to die if they go back to Jerusalem. Thomas always dealt with the facts. As he saw them, he saw the Lord was determined 
to go back to Jerusalem. And Thomas decided you could look at it either way you want to, either he's being a skeptic and he's saying, well, if he wants to go back to Jerusalem, then let's go. Or you could look at it like this. He knew that Jesus was determined to go or it was going to be unsafe. And Thomas decided that he was going to go with him. And he told the apostles he had decided, let's go with him so that we may die with him. Thomas has decided that death with Jesus is better than life without him. And he's ready. Now I want you to look at another event where Thomas has recorded his words for us. Go to John chapter 14. I want to look at another event in Thomas's life, and I want you to see his reaction. In John chapter 14, beginning at verse 1, Jesus has told his disciples he's going away, and they are upset. He has been with them for three years. All their hopes and their dreams are based upon him. They cannot believe he would leave them. He told them, I'm going away. In John 14, verse 1 and 3, he could see they were upset. And he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you into myself that where I am, there you may be also. And look at verse 5. The Lord said... Or in verse 4, Jesus told them, And where I go, you know. And the way, you know. But look what Thomas said in verse 5, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Thomas is looking at the facts. He's looking, he's trying to find the solid facts. He's looking for the facts here. And Jesus told him in verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So we see in our minds this picture. Thomas is the only one that had the courage to ask this question. We don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Thomas doesn't want to be in the dark. This is the kind of man he was. There is no indication here that the Lord resented this question. And he's the only one that asked it. He knew Thomas well. Jesus is going to the Father, included his death and his resurrection. Thomas didn't understand, but listen to me, neither did the other apostles. They could not see his death, or they weren't able to bear it. So Jesus told Thomas that without him there is no life there is no way there is no truth now I want to go back to the event that we're studying in John chapter 20 I want you to keep in your mind what Thomas a man that Thomas is he wants the facts he's looking for the solid facts so Let's go back to the event we're studying in John chapter 20. And once Thomas was committed, he's fully in. He would base his decisions on the facts, on what he saw, what he heard, and what he could touch. You know, if you think, he, he saw the other disciples say they would fight for him, they would die for him, they would suffer with him. And then when Jesus was arrested, he saw them run away. Not only them, but he saw himself running away. All their hopes and their dreams appeared to them to be vanished away when the Lord was crucified. Or so they thought. None of them understood. Thomas' skeptical attitude is with so many of us today. You know, we'll, we don't doubt a safe drinking water, do we? we? We go to the tap, we turn on the water, and we don't have any doubt that water's safe for us to drink. We don't have any doubt that the sun is coming up in the morning. We don't have, have any doubt that we look up in the sky tonight and we're going to see the North Star. But there are many today, when it comes to religion, 
when it comes to the life, death, and the resurrection of Jesus, we want some kind of demonstration. We want proof by sight. Like the Jews wanted a sign, and the only sign they were given was the sign of Jonah. Thomas wasn't a quitter. Thomas was not an infidel. Thomas was not a traitor. Thomas was not a denier of Jesus Christ. He was a doubter that Jesus was alive. He was just like us. Amen. Not a dime's worth of difference. Amen. He was just like us. For some to have faith, it's just harder than it is for others. Thomas was a week behind, wasn't he? He was a week behind the other apostles. But the Lord was patient with him. He dealt with him kindly. He, Thomas should have believed the prophets like Isaiah 53. He should have believed the sign of Jonah. Hey, Thomas knew who Jesus was. He saw with his own eyes all the many wondrous miracles. He saw Lazarus come from the grave after he'd been dead four days. He saw the funeral possession of the young man broke up by Jesus, taking him out to the cemetery. He saw the man born blind who was totally blind without hope whose sight was restored in an instant in a quicker than you could blink an eye. He saw the lame to walk, the handicapped to stand. He saw all of these wondrous things that Jesus did. And he knew the word of God and he should have remembered. But shouldn't we? He should have remembered the words of Jesus. Look at Matthew 9, chapter 20, verse 17. In Matthew 20, verse 17, now Jesus going up to Jerusalem took the 12 disciples aside on the road and he said to them, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify. And the third day he will rise again. Now what would you do if he took you on the side of the road and on the way to Jerusalem and told you all of that? We say to ourselves, we thump our chest and we say, oh, man, I wouldn't do that. I'd remember that. I'd know all these things. Would we? Would we? Thomas even should have believed the witnesses that came and told the apostles, Mary Magdalene, we'd say, I'd seen the Lord, all the other apostles. He should have, he should have believed John and, and Peter who ran to the tomb and saw the empty tomb and came back. He's not in the tomb. Then he should have believed all the apostles who say, we have seen the Lord. But there are many today who have not obeyed the gospel, that it would take a miracle for them to believe. There are many Christians who claim to be Christians who should be living a Christian life, whose light they should be shining the light of Jesus in the community. They should be bearing His light. But the light is flickering. And for some it has gone out. And we know the truth. But I want you to keep in mind that Thomas, him having the reaction he does, not believing that Jesus had rose from the dead, the Lord has a purpose in this. And it's for us. So Thomas missed the meeting, the first meeting. He missed the meeting with Jesus. All are in the room except for Thomas. The disciples are excited. They come up and they tell Thomas, we have seen the Lord. And Thomas says to the disciples in verse 25, unless I see his hands, unless I put my finger into the print of the nails 
unless I put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Would that be us? You know, I think about this, and if there was ever a meeting that Thomas should have been at, he should have been at this meeting, this first meeting. We have no idea why he missed it, except that God has a plan in this that's going to make a difference in our lives. And I also think, uh, look at what he missed. He missed seeing the Lord. He missed this great blessing. He missed association with his brethren. He missed having his needs supplied. But when you think about this, and you try to associate it with the today, when we fail to assemble with the saints, we miss worshiping God. We miss being at the table with the Lord and remembering his death, his burial, and his resurrection. We miss association with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We miss having all our needs supplied. We miss all of this and more when we fail to attend. And we can make up all the excuses we want to make. But it's still wrong. Eight days later, eight days later, they're again in that room. And I want you to put yourself there. They're in that room and the doors are shut and we're able to see this in our minds just like we are there. In verse 26 of John chapter 20, and after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands. Reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. What a moving event. Thomas received a tender rebuke from the Lord. But Thomas's unforgettable response was, My Lord and my God. And I could start from one end of this auditorium and walk all and work all the way across. And there is not a one of us in here that if we would have been there, we would have said those very same words. My Lord and my God. It's like we're there. We hear and we see like Thomas. And I'm telling you that God uses this for us today. We get an eyewitness account, an eyewitness statement, my Lord and my God, from a man who doubted, who doubts no more. We're able to look through the eyes of Thomas. Look at the message for us from God in the very next verse. This is for us. Verse 29. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. But now look, blessed are those who have not seen, but yet have believed. Oh, boy. What a message. Directly for us. We were able to look through the eyes of a doubter. How in the world could Jesus be alive? And we're able to look what Thomas sees. Being able to look at the print of the nails in his hand to put your finger in the print. You're even able to use your hand to put it in his side. This is for you and I. And we thank God for Thomas, for this eyewitness account, who couldn't believe that Jesus was alive. He had to have the facts. He had to see and he had to touch. 
And as we look through the eyes of Thomas, it should remove any doubt that we have in our minds that Jesus conquered death and he rose from the grave and he is alive today and makes intercession for us. And he's got a home reserved for his faithful. Why do some people doubt today? You ever thought about that? Why do some doubt today? I would think that there's not a person in here that doesn't have a little bitty bit of doubt creep into their lives at some point or another in their life. Maybe they feel like they have less responsibility. I don't know. When Beverly and I were kids, about, she was eight, I was 10, we used to walk this white wooden fence of my aunt's. And you didn't want to fall off of that fence because, oh man, it's too bad. It's full of alligators. And so we'd try to walk that fence all the way as far as it would go. But Jesus tells us there is no walking the fence. There is no middle ground. Doubting enters our hearts. Sometimes it's due to our lack of knowledge of God's Word. And when that happens, we're easily led astray. It's no wonder that person doubts when they don't even understand or know or have knowledge of God's Word, and they claim to be a Christian. In a world of corrupted Christianity, the world of corrupted Christianity has led many to become a doubter. And when we begin to fall away as a Christian, which we can, by turning our back on Him, we can leave our first love. We can fall from grace. And when we begin to do that, as a Christian, we begin to doubt. And you know what it's usually due to? Sin that it is in our lives. Doubt can lead us away from God. Satan loves to cause doubt. That's one of his favorite tools. Doubt leads us finally to unbelief. And we're so thankful that Thomas brought his doubts out in the open for us to see. He has helped us face our doubts that we have. Hebrews chapter 3, beginning at verse 12, says, Brethren, or says, Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, But exhort one another daily while it is called today. Least least any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of our confidence. Steadfast to the end. Let's all as Christians be steadfast to the end. Thomas' doubt was that Jesus conquered death, that Jesus rose from the dead. He loved the Lord. The Lord loved him. He was a disciple of the Lord. And when he knew that Jesus was alive, that he actually rose from the dead, he quickly said, my Lord and my God. Thomas had an honest heart. He wanted the facts. And Jesus gave him those facts. And those facts are for us today. The facts of of Jesus' death, his burial, and his glorious resurrection. Well, if you're not a Christian and you're here, what do we do? What are we to do? If we have never obeyed the gospel of our Lord and we're not a Christian, what in the world do we need to do? We must believe. We must believe. 
We must have faith, and faith comes by hearing the Word of God and believing in Jesus Christ. And when we believe in Jesus Christ, it motivates us. It motivates us into action by repenting of our sins. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We repent of our sins and we change our life. We repent of those sins to God and then we confess Him. Confess Christ before men that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then we're baptized for the remission of our sins. We go down in that watery grave. We contact the blood of Christ. We're buried with him in baptism. And we come up out of that watery grave, a new person in Christ. And then we live a faithful life to him. Revelation 2 and verse 10, be the faithful in the death, and I'll give you a crown of life. If you are a Christian... Have you fallen away? Is your heart turning away from Jesus Christ, our Savior? Have you not lived as a Christian? Are you, what are you a reflection of at home, in your community, at work? Has the world taken you over? Is your heart filled with doubt? And you've let that doubt completely overcome you and lead you away and fill you with excuses for why you're not faithful. If so, if you've been overcome by doubt, won't you come back? If you've never obeyed the gospel, we're going to give you the opportunity here in just a minute and there is no better time we can help in any way. Won't you come while we stand and sing? When you been to Jesus for the cleansing power, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood?